Um, welcome to the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policies program on navigating law school as a student of color. Um, I'm Elaine Lee. I am the 3L director of Lahanas at BC Law School. Um, Lahanas is a community that stands in solidarity with all the affinity groups on campus, especially in a time where it seems that all of our groups um, are in need of a voice and something is affecting all of us today. Um, today's program was inspired by our moderator, Brianna Broberg of 3L at New England Law School, um, who was a Rappaport fellow this past summer and wanted to be connected with other students and individuals who have shared a similar experience. Um, in addition to the BC Law students, we have students from other law schools joining us today. Um, throughout the academic year, the Rappaport Center holds programs um, that focus on significant public policy issues. Um, the next program that is happening is going to be on October 21st, um, which is going to focus on zoning and equity. Uh, for more information about the Rappaport Center programs and the Summer Fellowship, please see the website noted in the chat. Um, our program today is co-sponsored by Lahanas and the BC Law Career Services Office um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, is being recorded. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Brianna to everyone. As mentioned, she's a third year law student and she spent this past summer at Rappaport working in the mayor of Boston's Office of Immigrant Advancement. Um, she is a graduate of City College of New York and following college, she studied Arabic language and linguistics at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Brianna is interested in immigration law and public policy and has spent a significant amount of time volunteering with organizations dedicated to providing legal, social, and supportive services to refugees, asylum seekers, and other immigrant communities, um, other immigrant members in our communities. Um, so Brianna, if you wanna take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. I really appreciate your, your kind introduction. Um, hi, everybody. Um, as Elaine said, my name is Brianna Broberg. I'm a, I'm a 3L at New England Law. And um, I was a Rappaport Fellow this past summer in 2021. Um, as Elaine mentioned, as we progressed throughout the fellowship, we had a number of opportunities to kind of have conversations and talk about different public policy issues and also issues facing law students. And one of the things that um, I was really interested in talking about um, and hearing from other people about was um, navigating law school as a student of color. Um, it, it's something that I think can present sort of a unique um, challenge in what is already a very challenging and, and fraught experience. And I feel like it can help sometimes uh, when you are feeling isolated or you're feeling something heavy to just have other people who might be similarly situated um, to talk to about that, to um, share that you're not alone and, and to get thoughts and ideas um, from other people to, to sort of see what they're doing and also to be able to offer yourself um, as a, as a support system um, for them as well. Um, so I'm really excited to have this conversation. Quickly, I just wanna say thank you uh, to the Rappaport Center, um, BC Law Career Services and BC Lahanas for coordinating to, to host the event. And thank you to um, our three panelists uh, that are gonna be speaking today. I'm gonna give a, just a brief introduction um, of all three of them. Um, and then I'll ask them to, to take a minute or two and sort of talk about themselves, their background, um, sort of how they have or are currently navigating law school and, and what they're doing now. Um, and then we'll jump into some questions and conversation. And um, we will make some time at the end of today's event for um, a Q&A from the audience. So um, if you have questions at, at any point uh, during uh, today's event, you can put those questions in the chat and then I'll raise them um, to our, our speakers um, a little bit later. So joining us today, we're very fortunate to have Stephanie Johnson, Siri Nelson and Adrian Santiago Ortiz. Uh, Stephanie is an associate at Klein Hornig, where she focuses her practice on a wide range of affordable housing and community development matters with particular emphasis on tax credits and mixed finance public housing. Throughout law school, Stephanie was awarded several prestigious fellowships uh, and scholarships, including the Rappaport Fellowship. And she did that all while earning a dual JD from Boston College Law School and an MA in Urban Planning and Environmental Policy from Tufts University. During law school, Stephanie was an articles editor for the Boston College Law Review and a student attorney for the Civil Litigation Clinic. And she has experience working at the Executive Office of the Mayor in Washington, DC, 
the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development as a Siegel Fellow and for a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Siri Nelson is the Executive Director at the National Whistleblower Center. Siri served as an Associate Attorney and Policy Counsel at Cone Cone and Cola Pinto, the nation's leading whistleblower law firm, where she works closely with anonymous whistleblowers, legislators, and regulators. And Siri was the 2019 recipient of the highly prestigious Estelle S. Cone Memorial Fellowship, awarded by Northeastern University School of Law, where she was a co-chair of VALSA and was elected to be the commencement speaker for her class. She's also an adjunct professor of law at Northeastern, where she teaches whistleblower law. Adrian is a second year law student at Boston College Law School. He was born and raised in Puerto Rico and moved to Boston to pursue his bachelor's degree in biology at Tufts University. Before enrolling in law school, Adrian worked in public health academia for five years. He currently serves as the president of the Latin American Law Student Association and as the director of alumni relations for the first generation professionals at BC. His goal for the 2021-2022 academic year is to foster a broad coalition amongst the BIPOC affinity groups on campus by emphasizing similarities and intersections in identity. And in his free time, Adrian likes to propagate his plants, explore new cooking recipes, and dive into fantasy books while cuddling his cat. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to hear from all three of you. Um, I'll ask you if you could to just give us a little bit more information about yourselves um, one at a time, and I guess we'll, we'll start with Stephanie. Thanks, Brianna, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm a third year associate at Klein Hornig, and I mostly focus on affordable housing and community development work. And I am Developers Council, so I work with mostly nonprofit um, developers to help to create um, multifamily affordable um, apartments throughout Massachusetts, especially in Boston, but also work in a few of the suburbs of Massachusetts as, as well. Um, and I'm just excited to be on this panel to talk about law school and how to really make it through law school and thrive as, you know, a student of color. I feel like I went to, you know, Boston College Law School and it was a very interesting experience for me. Um, there weren't many Black students in my class. I think there were about, I would like to say nine Black students in, you know, my class. Um, and I actually ended up doing a dual degree program. So I didn't even graduate with the class that I started with. And the year after that, I think the class that I graduated with, I think there were only like seven of us. So like the Black community on campus was pretty small. Um, but fortunately enough, it, it was pretty close knit. So like when I started going, when I first started at Boston College Law School, I was heavily involved with BALSA um, and I ended up becoming one of the co-presidents of BALSA one year. And it was just such a wonderful experience for me to find community there um, and to really reach out to, you know, the Black Alumni Network and to ensure that we were putting, you know, BALSA students at the forefront when it came to securing different job opportunities and to being successful at OCI. So I really made it my mission to really um, make sure that the Black law students were able to access the different opportunities that were out there. Um, and I kind of serve as the liaison for that. Um, but I definitely think that to really make it in law school, um, I think you have to believe in yourself, believe in your abilities. Um, I think you have to, you know, ask for help when you need it. Um, and sometimes you get help from people that you least expect to get help from. Um, my 1L year, I took a property class with for some folks that are at BC um, with Professor Lyons. And I love that class and I loved him. Um, and at the end of the class, we took the exam and I ended up getting an A minus. And I'd worked really hard. And I was like, oh, like I really thought I was gonna get the A. Like I just don't understand, you know, I've been studying really hard. Like what, what made the difference between me getting the A and the A minus? And I went to him to have a conversation about that because I wanted to do better. Like I've, I've always wanted to challenge myself and be the best me that I can be. Um, and I sat down with him and he walked me through the difference between the A minus answer and the A answer. He's like, I'm going to teach you how to excel at law school so that now that you know, you know how to play the game. And he walked me through exactly what I needed to do to make sure that I could stand out, my, my exams could stand out. And there's really kind of a, 
strategic way to do it. And if you don't know about how to play the game, the law school game, right, you can get caught up, you can get thrown off, um, and you can get left behind. So to have someone kind of put me onto game in that way was really important. And I think as you progress as a law student, as a lawyer, you need to have someone who puts you onto game to show you how to play, play the game properly. Like even at my law firm now, there's a partner that has really taken a lot of, um, has really invested in me. And he has started to put me onto the game about how to excel as a, as a lawyer, how to, if I want to become partner, how to get on that partner track and how to have people see me as a partner from early on. So, you know, I think, and he's, a, he's, um, he's not black, he's actually, actually Japanese, but he's a person of color. But I still have to say, your allies won't always be people of color. They won't always look like you. Um, but when you see people that are willing to invest in you, um, I think you should be open to that, no matter how that investment, you know, where that investment comes from. Professor Lyons is a white man, and he invested in me in a way that helped me to really excel in law school. And I was able to make it on law review, graduate at the top of my class, and get a top award at graduation, and really stand out among my, you know, my classmates. And it was because um, his, his guidance really helped me to do that. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm really excited to hear more of your story and, and uh, your thoughts on some of our questions. Um, next, Siri, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Siri Nelson, Executive Director at National Whistleblower Center and a graduate of Northeastern University. I was also Brianna's mentor over the summer, and it was so fun to build a relationship with her and um, you know, that's one of the best ways that I try to support people who are currently in law school, just, just talking with them and trying to give whatever advice I can possibly give. <laughs> so I really just want to um, keep it brief so that I can answer questions and um, hear from you all because I just, I want to be a resource. Wonderful. Thank you, Siri. Um, and Adrian, if you would introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh First of all, thanks for inviting me into a panel with all these super accomplished people. Uh, it's like so impressive to be amongst all of you. Um, right, uh, so I'm in Santiago. I'm like the current and president of LALSA. Uh, coming into law school uh, was an experience for me. Uh, I went to Tufts University, which was also like a very white institution, but significantly different in terms of like who goes there, uh, people's politics, uh, just a general understanding of the world. Uh, but I feel like moving in, in these spaces, it's been a valuable experience, uh, especially meeting other uh, attorneys of, of color who have paved the way and uh, provide excellent uh, mentorship. Wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into some questions and um, they're kind of open for, for all three of you. And I might voice my opinion <laughs> sometimes too. Um, but uh, to get started, I'm just kind of curious if any of you had any particular concerns prior to entering law school as a student of color um, about uh, what what that might mean or or how to to navigate law school if it was something you were kind of consciously thinking about and then if so you know did you do anything to try to prepare for that um, or to to mitigate those concerns um, kind of what was that uh, beginning experience of law school like for all of you um, I can answer first on that one so me personally. I didn't see it as a unique situation because, you know, there's not people of color everywhere. So <laughs> I kind of expected that that would be the situation in law school, that it would be a pretty predominantly white space and that, you know, I would have to deal with the same realities that I deal with in a lot of the other spaces that I exist in. So 
um, mentally, I wasn't really prepared for actually the community of color that I found at law school. Um, I wasn't aware that there were so many affinity groups and people who were conscious of their identities and trying to figure out how to fit their experience as marginalized people into their experience as attorneys and law students. So that's something that definitely was came as a surprise to me. And I'm happy that I expected it to be a white space so that I could focus on that. But the, navigating the whiteness of law school was definitely different than navigating the whiteness of other spaces. And I think navigating the whiteness of the legal community is definitely different than a lot of experiences I've had. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I wasn't really aware of, um, consciously aware of um, and concerned about, you know, if there was gonna be a large black community on campus. Like I've always really, I've always gone to, um, kind of like predominantly white institution. So I was used to being in those types of spaces, but I would say that law school just felt very different. Um, I also felt like I had a harder time um, connecting with people at law school. And I think for me, um, like most of the schools that I've gone to, like I went to Brandeis for undergrad, it's a very big social justice school. So I've always been around um, really passionate people who are passionate about service and public policy um, and like really passionate about it. And I feel like when I went to law school, I couldn't really find that passion in the students. Um, and that was a little discouraging because I usually, I enjoy being around my classmates and learning from them in that way, feeling inspired from them. And I feel like just the way law school was set up, um, and what a lot of people were focused on, like so many people were so very much so big law focused. I didn't even know what big law was, to be honest. Like I really did not know. And that's on me because I should have done my research a little bit more about law school. But I was really going into law school because I love affordable housing. I want to do housing rights work. And this was just another step to help me get to do the work that I want to do on the level that I wanted to do it on. Um, so I think that's why I struggled a little bit um, socially in law school, but I was able to find a community of people. There were people in my 1L you know, section that I connected with and we were able to study together and I learned more about them and their passions. Um, I was also a public interest um, scholar on campus and we had the public interest law retreat that the public interest scholars organized. Um, and as a 1L, I was just kind of there like taking it all in when it came to organizing the logistics of the conference. But when I attended that conference, I think that was the first time where I was like, okay, I think I'll be able to find my people and my tribe. And that's the first time I was able to, you know, just get a better understanding of my classmates and what they're, you know, passionate about. I also think that law school is just a weird place because you can't really get to know people in the same way because when people are kind of competing and everyone has like, you know, who they show to the world versus who they really are. So it's a lot of like, I, I personally felt like a lot of people were putting on and trying to present in a certain way. We were all like type A people, a lot of us recovering type A people. So it was hard to really connect. And I feel like having those smaller spaces with like-minded people, we were able to connect. So in clinic, I was able to connect with folks. And, um, at the public interest law retreat, I was able to connect with folks. In BALSA, I was able to connect with folks. So finding pockets where we could put our guard down a little bit, it made it easier to you know, make lasting connections with my classmates. Uh, well, to, to echo Siri and Stephanie, uh, I, I'm navigating white in, in institutions like for a while, but I do feel like I I came in with an with a with a, an extra negative view of law school just from my understanding of like the system. Uh, I was like it prepared like to make it like through, through all of this alone uh, kind of thing, and I was extremely surprised as to like how how robust like the support system for uh, BIPOC students is, uh, you know, uh, uh, I am a first generation student and I think like the most 
stressful thing about coming in was just how much people understand like the legal system and understand American history properly. Uh, how much people know that like hidden curriculum. Uh, but I feel like with the help of like the student groups, the different groups, uh, especially, uh, I arrived at like a comfortable space and comfortable enough that I feel like I can also become that like for other people. Yeah, I, um, I agree. I'm, I'm sort of curious, um, just listening to what all of you said, talking about Balsa and Adrian, you're president of Balsa. Um, do you feel like uh, affinity organizations play a particularly important role um, in navigating your experience as, as a student of color? Or do you think um, it's more kind of finding common interests in, like say, Stephanie, what you mentioned about public interests, um, uh, interest groups or or is it a combination of those things um, how how can we kind of uh, develop or, or find our community is there any particular way that you all went about that um, I'm just curious to hear sort of how you decided <laughs> which organizations to, to join and, and sort of actively participate in and what experience um, or impact you think that experience had on on your time in law school I can jump in. Uh, for me, it, it was a very intentional process. I feel like, you know, uh, as soon as I walked into like the classroom, I was like, people of color, let's become friends. Let's uh, just start, you know, uh, supporting each other. Uh, I've always been like super focused on collaborating as like POC, just so that we can all take care of each other. Uh, I do think that the affinity orgs especially uh, should take a, a more pr probably prominent role in like student life uh, just because uh, like we are that connection like to alumni and to networking and, and just uh, the intersection of like first generation and uh, of color is like so high. So uh, just being that bridge uh, between a student and professional is is our focal point, I think. So I can jump in. So I would say it's a little bit of both. I When I started at BC, they had the Lahana's retreat. I think it was like a two day retreat. Um, so that was like before orientation for the entire 1-0 class. So because of that, I was able to meet other students of color and make friends. Like I was able to like make a close friend who was in my section. So it was easier then for me to kind of navigate and meet new people um, at, at the full orientation. Cause I already felt like, well, I knew some people. Um, I felt a lot more comfortable. So the Lahana's retreat was really helpful for that. But also, you know, um, being a part of Balsa was helpful as well, just because you have kind of upperclassmen that can serve as your mentor, um, that can put you onto different opportunities, that can connect you with some of the upperclassmen. You may feel like um, you don't really connect with people in year year, but you connect with the two L's or the three L's or, you know, and having people in an organization like Balsa or Lalsa, um, it makes it easier for you to meet those people. Um, also, I think the student government organization, they have like a mentorship program too. Um, and I got a mentor through that program and he was great. So his name was James Bohr and he was like the man on campus. Everyone loved him. He was at the top of the class. He was friendly with everyone. Like he was a real liaison. And because of him, um, I was kind of able to meet different people that I may not um, have had an opportunity to meet. And I was also able to get different outlines and um, different like, you know, study books. So, you know, I definitely think that just finding mentors through whatever channel you can get a mentor through, I think that's going to be beneficial. Um, finding community in an affinity group like, you know, Balsa or Lalsa, I think 
those affinity groups too are really good for networking. Um, and remember, these are like professional development groups. So, you know, when it comes to getting a job, like you will be able to meet more people through the affinity groups, just because more organizations are reaching out to them. When they want to have dinners with students of color, they reach out to the affinity groups. Um, then when they want to take you to a football game, they'll reach out to the affinity group. So you want to be in those affinity groups to get access to those opportunities to meet different, you know, partners and attorneys at different law firms that you may be interested in. Um, but also finding the people that, you know, vibe with you. Like, again, like I'm an affordable housing person. I had a hard time finding affordable housing people at law school just because like it's such a unique area and I was also very focused in on it um and sometimes I feel like I was a little too focused in on it I wish I would have explored immigration a little bit more or like criminal law a little bit more but if there are ever any pro bono opportunities I definitely say take them um because that's when you'll be able to meet like-minded um like-minded people and that's how you'll you'll be able to kind of like cultivate your your tribe of people in law school yeah i do, i agree with everything that you two have said and i also want to add the um extra emphasis on the access to information that participating in affinity groups gave me when i was in law school and how you know stephanie when you talk about the handbook for how to get through law school i got that from our bolsa chairs when i started like they did like a 1L retreat and it was like super intensive and they told us about every professor and what they do. And so, you know, depending on, I think the leadership of the affinity groups, you can get a really communal experience, but I've also witnessed um, affinity groups being toxic and um, people feeling very isolated because it's like you have, like what you were talking about the external face, like you have to show that everything is okay within your social group or your ethnic group. And then like, there could be all kinds of issues going on, but you feel like you can't talk to anybody because if you speak to somebody outside of the group, that's gonna make your group look weaker or you know, kind of promote stereotypes that um, might be negative about your group that ultimately will negatively affect you. So I think having personal relationship, especially maintaining relationships with family, even if you feel like, they don't understand your law school experience per se, they will understand a lot of the social dynamics. And if things kind of go left in your affinity group, those people are probably gonna be the best ones to let you know like how to navigate that. But um, I feel like it's a both end thing. When you're dealing with people with similar interest areas, what I found in law school was that there were a lot of friendships that I had that were based on interest areas whether they be within affinity groups or outside of affinity groups. And those friendships, didn't give me the same resources that the affinity groups gave me. So people in this shared interest don't necessarily feel so comfortable sharing resources because there's a bit of a comp competition that's underlying. And I found that faculty and staff at the university who had shared interests were more of a resource to me than my peers who had the interests that I had. Um. Yeah, thank you. I'm just <laughs> kind of trying to take some mental notes for myself here and think about what I can bring back to my other uh, New England law students. I really appreciate hearing all of your um, perspectives on this. Um, I have a question that I, I don't know whether any of you have also felt this way, but um, for me, um, I've never been a person who who really lacked confidence. I wasn't, um, I don't think super cocky, but I always felt pretty comfortable in myself and my abilities um, kind of until I went to law school. <laughs> and then um, I definitely have felt some level of um, imposter syndrome. Um, and I don't know how much of that I can attribute to being a student of color in a space that's predominantly white or, or if it's something else, I'm not sure. But um, I'm just kind of curious if any of you could share thoughts about um, kind of maintaining confidence in yourself um, in law school, if there was anything that you did or that in hindsight you think, you know, I wish I would have done that, um, that, that you would like to, to share with us. And also, I'll just say, um, Elaine, if you have anything that you want to say, I would be super interested <laughs> in hearing your perspective. So if at any point you want to jump in, um, please, please feel free. Uh, 
Okay. Well, <laughs> I definitely struggle with confidence, like a lot every, every day. Um, <laughs> and, um, in law school, it was especially bad in one L year, uh, my sense of, of not belonging went to the extent of severe depression and suicidal ideation. So I honestly thought that I was going to be such a failure at law school that it would have been better for me to die as someone who'd gone to law school than to live as someone who'd fail at, who's failed at law school and been ashamed to my family because I failed. Um, so that's how severe it was for me. Um, one of the things that helped was uh, just kind of having a dose of humility in terms of my expectations of myself and my expectations of what the experience at law school should be like. And I think a lot of times, you know, we get sold this idea of what a lawyer looks like, what a successful law student looks like, what success means and feels like. And those are just made up fantasies that serve interests that are not our own. And I feel like what helped my confidence was accepting the support from anybody who was willing to give it, allowing myself to truly receive it and take it to heart and lean on those people, regardless of their background or some of their political differences from me, um, and just reaffirm the fact that I have my own approach to life and it got me this far. So as long as I continue honoring that, then I'm gonna continue to proceed. And I'm happy that I overcame that bout of depression and now I'm able to say that I, I am a um, executive director and that's something that I would have never saw for myself. And um, confidence is definitely something I continue to grapple with, but feel resilient in as well. Sorry, thanks for sharing that. Um, I just kind of want to piggyback on that and just say like law school is a weird place. Like everything about it is just off. You're like, okay, something isn't quite right here. Like everyone isn't quite, like it's just so, it's a weird, everyone is like, trying to show their best selves without trying to show their vulnerability. So you, it's hard to really connect with people in that way. And if you are a person who um, you're inspired by your classmates and you, and you enjoy connection with others, I think that you can feel isolated in law school because it just doesn't feel like that. That's not the environment for that. But what I will say is that I think you have to trust yourself. Like Siri said, like you know how you work, you know how to excel. Stick, stay true to that, but also remember your why. Like remember why you came to law school, what you want to use the degree to do. And whenever you feel like you know your confidence is wavering, go back to that because that will always put you back on the right. Um, on the right track. One thing about law school is that it can sometimes convince you that there's only one way to be successful. You do OCI, you get a big law job, you apply for a clerkship, you get that clerkship, you go on law review. And if you're not doing those things or you're a three L and now you don't have a job, everyone's like, oh, you don't have a job, what's going on? It can make you feel less than, and that can lead you to depression and anxiety. And I've seen a lot of my friends go through severe depression and anxiety um, during law school, that was really debilitating. And um, it really hurt me to see them go through that. And I tried to support in the ways that I could, but you know, there's only so much that you can do. So if you ever find yourself, um, when, it, when it becomes too much, and sometimes in law school, it can become too much. Like definitely try to get help, try to speak to a counselor. I think um, different universities have different like therapists on campus. I think when I did a dual degree program, um, I actually went to a therapist at um, Tufts and it was the best thing ever. Like when I tell you she helped me with everything, she helped me write emails because I was like, oh, this person is saying this and I'm going to say da, da, da. She's like, okay, Stephanie, no, we're going to say it like this. But she helped me to navigate life. And I feel like it was such a um, important tool and just like a person that I needed in my life at the time. So definitely try to seek out, you know, outside resources for help, but go to your school for help too. Um, and also like Siri said, like be close to your family, be close to your friends before law school, like stay connected to that side of your life because sometimes law school can take over and it's all about being in the library and doing X, Y, Z. 
But remember that you had a life before that. You went to the gym before that. You went to church or temple or mosque before that. Do those things because those are the things that will help you to stay grounded when the world is like turning upside down. And in that same vein, uh, you know, there are people at law school that like do care about your success. You have mentors, you have these affinity groups. There are people that have gone through similar things uh, as you. And uh, as for me, like, you know, I, I'm here to support who I can when I can. And that's the case uh, for a lot of the other student leaders. Uh, we made it here to law school. Uh, we're meant to be here. We, and like the school is invested in our success as well as an institution, even if at sometimes uh, we are at like odds with a white institution, uh, right? So it's okay to rely on people. It, it's okay like, to be vulnerable, like to friends, like partners. Uh, even, you know, uh, communicate with a, a professor or, or the admin, uh, you know, uh, I feel like because law school is so similar to high school that it's just a trauma response after trauma response for people, uh, but it's not high school. People, they've been through their lives uh, and uh, like they are more than adequate help for you, if anything. Um, so Siri and, and Stephanie, a little bit too, you kind of touched on um, connecting and staying connected with your family and friends outside of law school. Um, but I do wonder if you all experienced this, I imagine that you did um, with those folks in your life who didn't go to law school, who aren't lawyers, um, it can be kind of difficult sometimes <laughs> to talk about what you're experiencing in law school. Um, I find myself, I, I talk to my mom all the time, but I find myself kind of um, not saying everything that I'm thinking and feeling that I would like to express to her because I feel like, oh, she's not going to understand and then I'm going to have to explain it and then that's even more exhausting. And so um, but I want to stay connected with with her and my my other family and friends um, who, who aren't part of law school. Is that something that you all dealt with? And and do you have any wise words of wisdom <laughs> that you can give me um, and give us about the, how you maintain those relationships and and what we could try to do? I can jump in. So for me. Um, I talked to my mom, but when I was in law school, I would talk to my mom, but I would never tell her about um, like specific details about law school because she just wouldn't understand. Like my mom is super sweet, simple, and I also don't like to tell my mom things that will hurt her. Like if I am hurting and I share that with my mom, she will hurt. And I have always tried to protect my mom um, from that because I don't want to burden her in any way. She's like been through enough. Um, so I won't say that's the healthiest thing. I definitely feel like you need to be able to talk to your parents about, you know, whatever, but also feel like different people are in your life for different reasons. So I may not be able to talk to my mom about the details of law school or tell her if I'm struggling, but I can talk to my best friend Dustin about everything. Um, so, you know, I kind of pick and choose who I share certain details with, um, and that really helped me to kind of stay connected with them, but also not burden them with, you know, some of my concerns that I have. Um, so I definitely would say pick and choose like who you share, um, information with because, you know, not everyone will understand and not everyone will be able to give you the advice or the help that you need, but also you have to remember to that everything is not about law school, you know? Like you can talk to people about things other than law school and it's great. And I, I, I highly recommend that because again, you have to remember that like you have, you had a life outside of law school and you still do. And you were able to connect with these folks 
before law school and you should still be able to connect with them now. So, um, and sometimes it takes your mind off of the things that you're going through in law school too, to talk about other things like TV shows or, you know, whatever else you like to do with that person. Um, I personally have experienced this disconnect a lot, especially like when you become an attorney, it doesn't stop. It's not like, oh, people didn't understand what I was going through during law school, but when I'm studying for the bar exam and when I'm actually working as an attorney, they're going to get it. No, like people who don't go through this process don't get it. And it can hurt relationships a lot if, um, we let that hold us back from actually being vulnerable with the people in our lives who are used to relying on su for support. And also when we assume that just because they don't get the details of it, that they won't get the idea that's really at the heart of what you need them for. So like, you know, everybody knows what it's like to be stressed out. Everybody knows what it's like to deal with like weird power dynamics and like stuff that people try to do. Like I get shocked sometimes when I talk to my sister or my mom about something and they're like, oh yeah, that person's just trying to do this. And I'm like, exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> it might be cloaked in like some weird legal process, but it is just the same stuff that humans do everywhere. Like, <laughs> and, and friends and family can always understand that. They're like, oh yeah, you're getting bullied. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> who does she think she is or whatever? <laughs> like, you know? So it's like, you know, no, they don't understand what SBA is no they don't understand what like sip <laughs> pro is but they understand that if somebody's throwing you shade every time they raise their hand in class that that's a problem so I feel like just communicating with them about that kind of like shared aspect of everybody goes through this like and I think also helping like thinking about it that way is a good way to help you ground yourself and be like yeah what I'm going through is like the same stuff everybody goes through like yeah, I'm stressed at work because I have way too much to do and a lot of expectations. Like anybody can understand that. But if I think of it like, and I have also this confidentiality requirement that nobody really understands and whatever, I get lost in the weeds and it just feels isolating. Uh, for me, uh, I, I've been away from my family uh, geographically since I was like 17 like they're all in like Puerto Rico so I don't see them that often but uh, I always do my best just to like call every day and speak to my mother just to have like her voice even even if like you're not like commiserating or anything like that it's just important like to stay in contact also for the good things right you know ask your mom ask your gate How's her day going? Like you don't uh, exist in this isolation as a law student. Like like you are this complete person with uh, with connections outside the school. I also want to uh, speak to the reality that a lot of people have very severed relationships with their biological families for very good reasons, and that can be even more isolating during the process of going becoming an attorney. But chosen family is also a really great resource. And a lot of times, you know, fortifying your relationships and making it clear to people that they are your chosen family can help them understand their role in your life and become an even better support for you. Yeah, I think um, all of that is, is super valuable and really good perspective uh, to, to keep in mind. Um, so I have many more questions, but I don't want to get to the end of the program without giving an opportunity. If anyone uh, else in attendance today had anything that they wanted to ask, um, you're welcome to put questions in the chat if you want, or if anybody wanted to raise their hand <laughs> and ask out loud, um, you're welcome to do that. Um, so I'll take a second now and just see if anybody has something that they'd like to, to raise, because um, I don't want to uh, drive the entire conversation and not let anybody else have the opportunity to ask anything. And that goes actually for our, our panelists and, and Elaine as well. If any of you have questions that you thought of that you would like to raise, um, please, please feel free. Yeah, 
I feel like all of my professors in my Zoom classes who are like, is anybody out there? Even though I know you are, but. <laughs> Um, okay, well, if, if anybody thinks of a question that they want to ask, please feel free to, to ask um, in the chat or to raise your hand. Um, but I, I do have a question that's a little bit different than some of the things that we've been talking about so far. Um, so at my law school uh, recently and, and in the past, but, but um, specifically this year, we've had some issues with particular professors who um, are not always careful about the language that they use in class. Um, when we're talking about cases um, and they might be presenting them in a way that isn't sort of culturally competent or um, in a way that, that can be insensitive or, or harmful, um, trauma-inducing for some of the students. And, and I don't think probably intentionally, um, but it's something that, that comes up. And sometimes, um, you know, Sometimes students feel comfortable raising that to, to the professors and sometimes that's received and sometimes it's not. And that can cause, I think, um, repeat trauma when you try and, and raise a concern and you kind of get shut down. Um, also, even just having to talk about it sometimes can, can be really difficult. And so um, I'm just curious if anyone has any thoughts um, about ways that students can approach those sort of issues in class, um, whether that's you know yourself or, or leveraging other students or someone else within the school, if, if there's anything that, that you could speak to about that, because um, I feel like it's probably not unique to New England law. <laughs> uh, so I can comment on this. Uh, like, like the first thing is that like, you don't need, need to do that if like you don't have the space, right? Uh, I feel like just with like the legal system, uh, especially in like the U.S., there's very much like this constant talking of like of like white like versus black, and that can be just beyond stressful for like black students in like con law or like contract law. It's just a bit, uh, it's a bit ridiculous in my opinion. Uh, so people don't need to address it themselves. You know, there are student leaders uh, to speak to that uh, would be more than happy to uh, speak for you. There are, uh, there's Lohanas, there's like, like, like the admin. Uh, and I'm not sure if everyone is aware, but at like ABC, this became such an issue that like we had a student group lobby like to start a critical race theory class, which was uh, successful. So, you know, organizing is, is important, you know, don't feel like you're alone, uh, get your friends together and you can do something about it. I wanna echo the, uh, the assertion that it's not on you to speak up if that's what you don't feel like. I feel like there's this idea that to be a good ally or person of color, you have to be the voice for things and you really don't like you're a person first. And, you know, there's other people who uh, have more, more free time <laughs> and they can spend it doing that. And I'll also say I, uh, from a perspective of a professor, I currently teach at a law school as a professor with a co-professor who is demographically very different from me and who I took classes with and at the classes that I took with him as a student, my colleagues were like, he's so racist, he's terrible, like his language is the worst. And so working with him and knowing that I have to help the students understand that it's a generational thing as well, like, and like, also help him understand what language is appropriate and what language isn't appropriate. And that's my responsibility because I'm a co-professor, not because I'm a woman of color. And, <laughs> and it's just, it's an ongoing effort that can be collaborative. And some professors are more receptive than others. In our last semester, our students were frustrated that there wasn't enough intersectional analysis of the whistleblower issue. And I allow, I created space for them to have a deeper discussion about that and try to meet their needs in terms of 
you know, what they wanted to hear. But at the same time, I think a lot of law professors struggle because of the doctrinal requirements and understanding the law first and foremost being the goal of law school. And then having the topic of intersectionality come into play in a way that's not necessarily relevant to the subject matter. So a good professor figures out how to weave it in or it does the best they can to do that. And not all professors are equipped to do that. Um, as a student, I always try to tie in my criticisms with the of doctrinal objectives when I did raise them. And I noticed that those were more well received because it helped the professors reframe what they were talking about without sacrificing what they believe to be the primary cause of their class. But it's, it's also demoralizing to feel that way, right? Like, why is my understanding of this issue not important and my discomfort not important and a core, a primary objective of this class, right? Like, that's very, very demeaning. But I mean, law school, it is what it is. And we're all rocking through, you guys are all rocking through it. So it's awesome. Um, I don't want to step on Stephanie or Elaine if either of you have something that you wanted to, to say on the topic. No? Okay. Elaine, do you want to say something? <laughs> oh, no. I just wanted to maybe add that um, as a student leader, um, and, you know, I might only have a certain way of looking at issues um, from my own perspective as an Asian woman on campus. Um, and that might mean that I might not be able to see um, Adrian's point of view. And so if Adrian can come to me and speak to me openly and honestly about it, and then we can communicate that, um, then I feel like that is very important in taking a step forward so that there is more solidarity among the communities and we are not just like isolated affinity groups. Um, and so I feel like that is um, something that I would wanna work on um, this year as Lahanas as a whole. Yeah, I feel like it's, it's really tricky and I'm asking you guys to just like solve this massive <laughs> problem that, that everybody deals with at their law schools. Um, but it's just something that's kind of been weighing on, on me um, in particular this year. Um, I'm the co-chair of our uh, SBA Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. And um, there's a lot of students who raise these issues with us and we wanna do what we can to help. Um, and I'm trying to sort of navigate what the different um, routes are to, to offer support. Um, but then also I find myself kind of getting personally weighed down by it. Um, and that can, that can also be challenging. And then I feel guilty because I feel like, well, but I want to help people. And, and so it's just kind of like a, it's a tough um, cycle. So it's just nice to, you know, even be able to just bring it up with you guys and, and hear what you have to say. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I think maybe I'll ask just one more quick question before we are, are done, unless anybody else um, has something that they would like to, to raise. Um, I'll give another moment for that. Okay, um, so I'm just wondering if you could offer, um, if, if any of you have any thoughts or um, advice, tips about, um, if you find or have found that as a student of color, there are um, sort of communities or opportunities, avenues that are difficult to access, if there are any sort of particular paths that you found or that anyone ever recommended to you to sort of um, tap into those um, opportunities. Um, I think that's something that uh, we've talked about at my school as being sort of second and third order effects of um, what we were just talking about, where you feel like your perspective um, isn't heard or understood in a class, it's not something that's necessarily valued, and then you might find yourself sort of feeling like maybe this isn't a space that I'm supposed to be in, and so you might kind of self-select out of potential opportunities. Um, um, so I'm just wondering if, if you have any thoughts um, in, in these last couple of minutes to, to share about um, how, how you approach that. 
I can I can speak on that. I think the self select out um, is actually a pretty common sentiment among students at law school, and I think it has to go back to um, what the other panelists have mentioned about like self confidence. Like you don't feel like you know what you're doing compared to everyone else at law school because they seem to know what they're doing. Um, but um, I think after my three years at law school. Um, I've started to realize that you really can't, um, you know, like negate your own like achievements that you've had. Um, and even though that's really hard sometimes because you didn't and you think, oh, everyone else could do it. That's not necessarily true. Um, and so like, if you do feel like that, I think that professors on our campus are awesome resources. Um, and, you know, if, you're feeling some type of way about, you know, your performance in class or how other students, when they say something in class might make you feel uncomfortable. Professors are really good at kind of understanding where you're coming from and accommodating how you're feeling about um, certain issues. Um, and so I think that when you are at a point where you're doubting yourself, your achievements or why you're at law school, um, Professors are great um, resources to remind you, like Adrian said, that you deserve to be here, even if you don't think that you are. Um, so. And uh, to echo that, like to add on to it, I keep saying echo, it's like law school jargon is like crap. Uh, you know, your point of view is just, it's just valuable to the law and it's, valuable like to employers it's valuable to like your friend group like your study group uh just being a diverse student like we think about things differently as Elaine was saying right yeah uh, so you know once again like you deserve like to be here and you should grab the opportunities that you can because like they're for you like i could take if you can right Just to add to that, you know, I always, I live my life by the motto of like, don't tell yourself no, let them tell you no. So always go after every opportunity, but be strategic about with how you go about different opportunities. So if you want to be on law review and you want to, you know, do that whole application and the whole process, you need to make sure that you reach out to the people that are on law review so you know what that experience is like um, and you get tips on how to excel at the whole process to make it onto law review. If you want to be a Rappaport fellow, you should speak to other Rappaport fellows before you apply and before you interview. So you have an idea of what you're getting yourself into. Um, you know, whatever you want to pursue, reach out to a person who's already doing it and learn from them. Um, because sometimes they'll share tips with you that, you know, will be the deciding factor between whether or not you get the opportunity or you don't. So you always wanna make sure that you're one step ahead with that. Um, and again, like, you know, when it comes to finding your tribe and your allies and your people, they may not all look like you, um, but be open to, you know, receiving words of wisdom that people who are here, who want to see the best for you, um, and who want the best for you, be open to receiving those words from them um, because it can come in a lot of shades in a lot of ways. Yeah, I want to, I know. I don't want to cut you off. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you answer. Yeah, I just want to just briefly yeah. say, allow people to push you out of your comfort zone. And and one way that we don't allow people to do that is when somebody says, hey, why don't you apply to be a Rappaport fellow? And you're like, oh, I can't do that. I don't see enough people who look like me who are Rappaport fellows. So that means that I'm not going to be chosen. Like I did that for like a year. And then my advisor kept on being like, I really think you should apply to be a Rappaport fellow. And I was like, you know, finally I did it and I became one. And I allowed people throughout my law school experience to do that for me. And it's really opened tons of doors. Thank you guys so much. Um, I really appreciate all of your thoughts and, and perspective. And thank you to everybody who attended. Um, we're, we're really glad that we have this opportunity to share this space um, and uh, hopefully see everybody at more Rappaport events uh, in the near future. Thank you.